beautiful passage of scripture this evening. And I've started out with something I feel we can certainly discuss uh, at length. We don't want to take the whole lesson to discuss it, but I used a portion from an author's book to kind of begin this lesson. I've been kind of marinating on uh, this thought this evening, and it's under the PowerPoint section. It really takes up almost half of the first page, but there is a lot of truth in this opening statement. Uh, it was kind of interesting in light of a previous a, um, sermon series that we did, Preaching Is, uh, the importance of preaching, uh, that we get to this passage this evening and it kind of draws attention to some of these things. So we are in Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 14 through 20. We'll go verse by verse tonight after this opening and we'll just go, go in that manner. Very famous author, Christian author, preacher, stated it like this, and this is abbreviated. But he said, if I were Satan, first, I would make people not see what they are really fighting against. Ephesians 6 chapter says we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. We are wrestling against principalities and powers and wickedness in high places and rulers of darkness, spiritual darkness. A lot of people think we're fighting against people. That's what the focus is on. A lot of people want to believe it is black and white. It is rich and poor. It is this faith against this faith. But ultimately, church, tonight, I, I need you to be reminded we are wrestling against something that is not flesh and blood, but is ancient evil that is in the world and has been here for a long time. If I were Satan, he says, I would attack men in such a way that they would not understand God's purpose for their lives. Have you talked to anybody recently that simply said it this way or maybe stated it this way? I just don't know what my cause is. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my reason. Maybe you've witnessed to somebody that says, why am I even here? What am I here for? Man searches for his purpose. God's word tells us what our purpose is. I would promote lies about true Christian leaders to undercut their efforts to share the gospel. Then I would introduce the idea and promote the idea that the Bible is hate speech. Now this is, this is if, this person said, if I were Satan. The whole point is, this is exactly what Satan is doing. Y'all catch it, right? The Bible is hate speech. I would rewrite the mental and, and, and mental health and health manuals in such a way that the soul, the word soul and spirit, are obsolete or non-existent. Hence, there is no focus on the keeper of the soul or the one who made the soul and the spirit, which is God. In fact, the whole point is to take the focus off of God altogether. I would downplay the importance of leadership and coming under authority and promote anarchy. That's where we are. You don't have to be under authority. Do what you want. Say what you want. Tweet what you want. Speak what you want. Write what you want. Nobody's your boss. <laughs> they don't have to come in under the authority of the word of God, let alone a, a pastor who preaches it. How dare he tell me how to live my life? We are there. We've been there. I'm talking about as a nation, as a country, as a world, we are there. And this spirit will be with a riotous tinge to it or a, a riotous spirit of hate. Boy, I'll tell you, let's look back over the last four years. We're there. Next, I would use social media as a means to accelerate the perversion of God's true gospel and everything associated with it. 
There are people that are on their phone so much and believing everything they see on their phone that they have no idea what God's word says today. And they are taken by every wind of doctrine that is blowing. And many of those are blowing right off the cell phone into those people's eyes and ears and into their soul. And then there they are. I would promote cowardly Christian leaders who don't read the Bible, but create their own agendas and curriculum apart from God's word. These leaders would go on to become heads of well-attended theological seminaries. These seminaries would produce generational offspring of apostates who have deconstructed the faith and are teaching doctrines of demons. That's what scripture says. It is even in the seminaries today, not all, but many, that some preachers graduate with a, with a degree in ministry and don't even believe that Jesus is the Christ. Finally, I would attack the Christian church so that no one who was left to contend for the faith. I would create weak pulpits that preach sugary sermons for silly people who are easily led astray. Sugary messages for silly folks with sappy preachers that are preaching. I would lead people to focus more on their personalities, their, their uh, thinking within, than on the attributes of God that clearly tell us what he thinks and how he feels about our sin. I would promote Bible teaching pastors as troublesome, bigoted, unkind, phobic, unloving, and antiquated. I would lead pastors down paths that distract the congregation from knowing how to fight the good fight of faith. And I would call all of this progress and change for the good. If I were Satan. No, we know Satan won't do that. He already's done it. And man's perpetuating. Amen? <laughs> Anybody want to discuss any of that for just a few moments? Is that is that got some truth to it? That's exactly where we are. Now that's the abbreviated version. There was a lot more to that, and I thought, oh my goodness. What have we fallen to? So with the backdrop of that, uh, that being the backdrop that is, and then looking at this text tonight, there is an importance to preaching. Yes. There is an importance to understanding the truth of the gospel. There is an importance to understanding the power of God's word. There is an importance, and, and, and this cannot be overstated tonight, to obeying God's word at all costs. I want to be in a church where people obey God's word at all costs. This is what the book said. I'm standing on it. That's the end of discussion. That's it. He said it. I believe it. I'm living it. God said it. I took it into my heart. I'm living it. Amen. So with this backdrop, consider the truth of Romans 10, 14 through 21. That continues to look back at the first 13 verses address the idea of God's election now I'm gonna go ahead and tell you all already know because you've heard me preaching is under attack it's under attack in a myriad of ways but two ways is simply there is a false gospel that is in many different forms out there that is meant to undermine the true gospel that is being preached by preachers who believe the truth of God. The other way is simply to attack the people that preach it. That's both in this opening text. All right? So with that being said, this draws attention, uh, draws uh, attention of those who are lost um, who are God's elect. There, if you looked at any of the texts in the previous 13 verses, chapter 9, you will understand this. This was one of the main ideas, and especially when it got to dealing with Israel, but also with the Gentiles, 
There are those out there that are still lost, but they are the elect of God. What does that mean? They have not yet heard the gospel in a way that it has affected their heart, and they are literally waiting before they, the, the, when they hear it, God will deal with their hearts and they will be saved. Romans 8, 28, Romans the ninth chapter, they're already called and God has elected them in eternity past. But the church must do its part. So I, I've said this at least once a year ever since I've been here. I don't even know the name of the rapper. He's a Christian rapper. He's a Christian rapper. I don't even know the name of the song, but I just remember this one line, and it said it this way. It said, the next Billy Graham could be under a bridge waiting on someone to stop by and give him a word. The next Billy Graham could be under a bridge in dire straits waiting on someone to speak a word to him. The next Billy Graham could be a homeless person on the back alley somewhere waiting on you just to, at the right moment to go by and say something to them that will change their lives. The next one of God's elect could walk through that door on service. And all of us, not just the preacher, all of us need to be ready to say something, to pray for them. Amen? Anybody want to discuss this PowerPoint? Something to say? I started asking to, and then I went on down the line. Anybody? Is that? Yes, sir. I've been reading and talking about the current ideology of man. Mm -hmm. And you read all through this, and it's full of I, 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 I. And we live in a day of what they call a radical individualism. Yeah. yeah. All that matters is me, what I think, my opinion, my truth, everything. And that is the exact opposite of what Christ teaches because the Bible tells us that I must decrease and he must increase. And that's mm -hmm. why these two ideologies are always at war. Mm -hmm. Battle between two kingdoms, two ideologies, two trains of thought. Satan wants you to focus on you. Christ asked us to focus on him. Amen. Peter, when he was on the water, what did he begin to focus on? His situation. Instead, he took his eyes off of Christ. Interesting. Anybody else? It's kind of scary to a point, but once again, we can say, check. <laughs> We're not surprised. Anybody surprised by any of this? No. This is the world we live in. And, and it has been steadily slipping. Some people say, oh, it started slipping when COVID. Mm -mm, it wasn't COVID. It started slipping when the recession. No, it wasn't a recession. It's been steadily slipping for a long time. Amen? Anybody else?
Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Well, you know what? I'm glad the Lord sent you our way. I remember our first conversation, Sister Mary. And while we're on that point, I wasn't here Sunday, and I completely slipped my lines the previous Sunday, but Miss Mary is joining our church, and we have found her in great standing, and she's she's uh, accepted Christ as her Savior and, and has rededicated her life, and so she is a part of us now. Amen. She's been coming, but praise the Lord. When I think of her, I think of our fir her first conversation, our, our first conversation was right there on the parking lot, right about at the corner up there. And uh, she stopped me, and I think her son was standing there. And it was one of our first conversations. And she said, I've been a lot of places, and very few were preaching the gospel. Very few were, were preaching Christ. What she just said just now. And that was on one of those days where I was just, you know, I had, had preached and the Lord had blessed, but I was just weary and worn. And I want you to know that energized me that day. It, it, even though I was physically tired, it let me know the Lord spoke through that. Keep doing, not just me, but keep doing what you're doing. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what makes the difference. A lot of people are, are going towards deliverance ministries and, 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 and community service ministries, and, and they have left out the main thing. We preached that a long, a long time ago. Keep the main thing the main thing. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again. That's the crux. That's the center of all we do. The gospel. Every song. Every chicken dinner, I don't care what it is, Sunday school, outreach, VBS, whatever it is, the center of it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus be at the center of it all. I know my wife's going to get home tonight. She said, we need to sing that song. Amen. Jesus is at the center of it all. Amen. Thank you, both of you, for sharing. Anybody else? If not, we'll move on. Amen. So you know what we're up against. And, and while I'm there, I'll go ahead and, and speak of what I just said at the beginning. It is not man. Man can be a tool, but it is a diabolic, demonic plan to institute the things that I just read to you in this, this opening. It is, it is the enemy's plan to distract, to destruct, to tear down, to, to pull away. And we must fight the good fight of faith, church. Amen. So that being said, uh, verse 14, that with the background of what we read, look at this. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, Verse 13 says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then verse 14 then says, how can all these things happen? And then down at the beginning it said, without a preacher. So you got churches nowadays that says, and they're out there. I mean, look them up. Don't, don't get too close to looking at them. But they're out there where they meet and have chat groups. No preaching. You've got churches out there, and, and I've, I've been to a few that are guilty they will sing the horns yeah. off a of billy goat. Yeah. <laughs> and then the preaching is about that much. I remember the first time, I was 16 years old. And, and, and it was a service at our church at that time. It wasn't any of our folks. But we had sang and sang and sang and sang. And people were, wah, 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 and all that. Then the preacher that came from out of town got up. Opened up something, looked at something, said, well, the Lord didn't give me anything. And I'm sitting there on the front pew. I'm thinking, this brother showed up with a whole white Snow White suit on. White shoes, tie, and everything to match. And had nothing, and you drove that far? The Lord gave you nothing? Now, to me, if that happened... Whenever that was, 1987, yeah, somewhere in there. Long that it's happened a lot. There's always 
a word from the Lord. One of the last things my pastor told me before he said, you're, you're on your own, buddy. I'm, I'm off. I'm out. I'm headed back to where I belong. And he said, if you can't think of anything else to preach, preach Jesus. He'll preach. <laughs> I said, yes, he will. Preach Jesus and him. That's what Paul said. And him crucified. So we can't call. You can't call on somebody you haven't heard about. That leads me to the next point. When you preach, y'all remember this. If Jesus is not in the sermon somewhere, something's wrong. Just listen. Just listen. If, if, if it doesn't end up or, or begin or where, with the gospel or the gospel's not in the middle or somewhere. Now I've heard people preach differently and there are some very seasoned preachers one just recently preached, if you caught it, the gospel was at the beginning, but it was there. Amen. If you get message and there's no connection to the main character of the Bible, then we've got a problem. Yes. Yes. Sir. That should apply to the teaching also. Mm -hmm. Preaching, yeah. teaching, everything. Yeah. Like I said earlier, even the chicken dinners. Amen. <laughs> I'm being funny in a sense but no no every every auxiliary of this church every ministry whatever you want to call it every expression you know I remember as I grew in the Lord I began to look at music and things and some of those songs that we used to I like that that wasn't a song that that wasn't scriptural we just liked that because it was bumping <laughs> Cut it off the uh, cut it off the list. It, it, it it's gone. We don't need that one. We need stuff that points to Christ. Yeah, yeah. Amen. How should they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how should they hear without a preacher? Verse fifteen. And how shall they preach except they be sent? Stop right there. And we can take some time and deal with this if you want to really look at the, the outline here and go down below verse 14. Uh, uh, you see sent, preaching, hearing, believing, calling. I firmly believe what this scripture says is that a preacher must be called. He must be sent. You do, you do not just wake up one day and say, that's a job I'd like to try. And go take some classes and then start preaching. The old folks used to say it this way. Some went that wasn't sin. All right. So if you look at your handout, you see here, anyone can call upon the name of the Lord, but you can't call on someone in whom you don't believe. You can't believe on someone you haven't heard about. You can't hear about someone that hasn't preached, hasn't been preached about regularly. Preaching is necessary. Preaching is prevention. Preaching is protection. Preaching positions you. And to some, preaching is foolishness. But to those who believe on the name of the Lord, it is salvation. So look at the progression. You have to be sent in order to preach. So do you see how the progression would be damaged? And even God is God enough. He can use those that just decided. But yet and still, it can damage the progression. It can cause great harm if you are listening to preaching by someone that was not called. Do y'all catch that? Turn to Titus verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Titus. Right after 2 Timothy and the pastoral epistles of Paul, he writes to Titus. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and to the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. Have y'all heard that before? That was in Romans. Promised before the world began. But half, here it is, in due times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. 
that go, goes to show you, that shows us real fast that it is a man of God who is called to preach. He is committed by God to preach. He is called to deliver God's word. And God manifests himself, his word, through preaching. Do you all believe that tonight? It's not just anybody. It's not just any Joe Schmo off the street. It, it, and God can use anybody. He can, but they have to be called. Not somebody that just shows up and says, this is what I've, I'm, I'm telling you. This is what I'm coming up with. There is a great danger in that. All right? The word preaching. Literally, that word uh, means that which is proclaimed. I thought this was interesting. By a herald. <laughs> or y'all will get on the way home. Or a town crier. Amen. My first name's Harold, by the way. <laughs> that which is proclaimed by a herald or a town crier. So in years past, in ancient, or not ancient, but in early America, they would, they would say, seven o'clock and all is well. Town crier. Preachers are town criers. They are to literally stand on the wall that is a figurative part. Stand up and declare what is happening in this generation according to God's word. What, as they've said for years, if you've heard it said in the Baptist church, what thus saith the Lord. Y'all know it, right? Amen. What thus saith the Lord. Verse 15 then clearly points out again that it is a calling. They have to be sent by God. As it is written, and he quotes Old Testament, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Stop right there. We'll get to beautiful feet in just a moment. But I want to deal with the gospel of peace. Boy, that is a powerful phrase. You realize that before you accept the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, before you are saved, before you accept Christ as Savior, you are at war with God. Correct? Yes. Why? Because of your sin. You are at an enmity with God. You're an enemy of the kingdom. Now, the beautiful thing is, you're still elect. <laughs> wow. Praise the name of the Lord. God, wow, mm, still seeks to, to bring peace. So why would they call it term and praise God, the gospel of peace? Because that is what the Lord uses to bring peace to those who are at war with him. The old folks didn't have theology, maybe we have, they didn't have all the Bibles and the study stuff we have, but they just said it this way. One day he spoke peace to my soul. Mm. Praise God. Anybody have that testimony tonight? That he spoke peace? You were tired of fighting. <laughs> you were weary. You were tore up from the floor up. And the Lord spoke peace. Mm, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He, he gave you peace where there was no peace. Praise the Lord. So how beautiful are the feet of them. That, 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 that word beautiful means in a continuous bloom. Now, you may not grow as, as, and this is for the Christian, then we'll get to the preacher in a minute, but just in the term of the word beautiful or blooming, you, you may not grow as fast as everybody else, but the good news is you're growing. Amen. Now, for the preacher, that word beautiful here, the, the pastor, the one who declares God's word, it means to continually produce something that is growing. Now, God's word in the believer produces growth. That's you got to have that. And it's in settings. I say this all the time, like these in which growth occurs. All right. So how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, 
the calling of a preacher is necessary and important. And once again, it's in your handout. Some have gone that weren't called. Um, and God calls them first, and then they preach. But now, catch this. Everybody doesn't look at a preacher today as beautiful. Amen. Remember something my mom said. Uh, she said, Peacock <laughs> thinks it's beautiful until it looks down at its feet. <laughs> Think about it. It says, it's got ugly feet. Well, preaching and preachers have been painted ugly by the world's viewpoint. And man has done a lot, Satan certainly, but man has done a lot to not help that cause. When people talk about preachers today, they automatically revert to, you know, people that were televangelists that fell and were crying on TV and said, I have sinned against my God. I'm not going to call any names tonight. Y'all get to go down the line and name all kind of them, but you know who I'm talking about. And had great ministries and, and amusement parks. <laughs> Christian themed amusement parks and mascara and and we could keep going big hair that 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 whole generation and on TV and, and send me your money send me your money and, and, and we've been lumped all together to make it look ugly but the scripture says the feet of them that are beautiful well, but catch this that doesn't mean your feet are beautiful you are beautiful when you preach God's word. Amen. As a preacher, we are beautiful when God's word is preached. Not because of us, but because of the message. And who the message is about. Praise God. There have been so many times that I wrestled and tried and tried to put together. And, and I mean, everything. It just, it was, it was all, man. I, I, where, 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 how, Lord, is how is this coming together? And then the Lord brings it together and Christ is glorified. It wasn't because of me. It wasn't because of my intellect. But it's because of the power of the gospel. A lot of messages with me. I can't speak for other preachers. But a lot of messages with me start when I consider how does the text connect to the gospel. And almost it's like you work backwards through through that means. All right? So let, let's deal with the call for just a few moments. Can we do that? I'm, I'm trying to hurry on. But if we go to Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, y'all should be familiar with this one. Real familiar. If you're familiar with it, say amen. Somebody said, I will be when I get there. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Y'all know it. And he gave, who's he? God. Some apostles. Now we won't go into that tonight and deal with that, but they're already, they're, their dispensation is passed off the scene. There are no modern day apostles now. Somebody will argue with that, but they're not. They're not. They, those are people that literally saw Christ. Unless you're over 2,000 years old, you're not still hanging around. They handled him. They saw him. Prophets or Old Testament. By the way, if somebody says I'm a prophet so and so, then that means you're subject to what the Bible says about prophets. And that means you've got, you got to give a prophecy. And if it's not accurate, we get to throw stones. That's what scripture says. They're marked by the fact that what they said, God told them to say. And when they said it, it happened. And that doesn't count with you saying, oh, the Lord told me to tell you tomorrow's Thursday. We already know that. Y'all will get that on the way home too. But here is what he did give. Watch this. He gave evangelists this dispensation. Those are those that share the word. Itinerant, move from place to place. And he gave some pastors and teachers. And some believe that the pastor can also be what we call a pastor teacher. For what? The perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for, of the, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We already know that part. But the point I want you to catch on is that he gave them as gifts. God, get it, sent them. 
God gave them to the church. So it cannot be a man who calls himself. That's got to come in line with what God does. God sends the man to do the work. Amen? The preacher, the pastor. Uh, go to 1 Timothy 3 and 1. How beautiful are the feet of those whom God calls. 1 Timothy 3 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. Now, let's pause real fast and, and be reminded that bishop, elder, pastor are interchangeable words. Now, in our particular sway of churches, we just call you, we call them people pastors. All right. Does everybody, is everybody clear? I didn't think that we would go into this tonight, but maybe we should. Um, clear on the difference between a pastor and a minister because I know sometimes it's interchangeable so people look at it that way um, and other churches call their deacons elders okay but actually we look at it elder pastor bishop overseer even can be termed the same and then deacons those are only two scriptural scriptural uh, offices in the church. Then a minister is what we would call a licentiate. They have a license to preach. Pastors are ordained to preach. They have gone through uh, councils to show themselves that they are there. And they, and they, when you're ordained, you're able to carry out the the, off, or the ordinances of the church. That would be uh, Lord's Supper and baptism, and you can marry and bury. Okay? All right? So, so it says, if a man desire. Now, somebody might look at that word and say, well, look, it's just the man who is desired. Well, that means if the man desire because he has been called, then he desireth a good work. Okay? Let me tell you a little bit about my story. I wasn't desiring the office of a bishop. <laughs> Y'all catch it? I was minding my own business. I was perfectly fine behind the 88 keys where I was. I was fine with it. I was good. I was content. Stephanie will tell you I was content to sit back there beside her on the back pew and every so often put my arm around her. And we were just having fun, just worshiping together. I was fine right there. Then the Lord started calling. And I didn't answer. I ignored. I pretended I didn't hear. I did a Jonah. Nineveh's there, I'm going this way. Paint Creek's here, I'm going this way. The calling is here. Lord, you're talking to somebody else. You're not talking to me. And he got my attention real in, in many different ways. He got my attention to the point that I was uncomfortable. All right? So God will call you. He calls and if you desire an office, if you finally say, Lord, I yield, I will do what you called me to do. If he desire the office of a bishop, overseer, pastor, he desire the good work. There is no greater calling than to stand and preach God's word to God's people. I love y'all. He's put me here as an under shepherd for a time such as this. But y'all not my people. <laughs> Y'all are the sheep of his pasture. Y'all catch that? I didn't bleed for not one of y'all. Amen. But Christ did. And one of these days, that's what kind of scares me. And it scared me when I began to consider. I, I thought about 1 Peter. And, and I think it's 1 Peter 5. We as pastors have to give an account for his sheep. How I've handled the word, how I've handled the sheep, how I, why I've done what I've done. Have I done it for filthy lucre? Have I done it for fame? Have I done it for prestige or power or whatever people do it for? But I'm here to tell you, we'll stand and look the great, the chief shepherd. Not just me, but eyeball, everybody else, eyeball to eyeball. That is a pastor. Jeremiah said it this way. He said, woe to the shepherds that scatter the flock. Amen. So it is not some jo job to say, oh, it's a glory position. 
and, and wow, that's, that, that's pop, that makes you popular. If you read the text, it's serious. They will stand, pastors will stand under a greater condemnation. Amen? So, all Christians are to be witnesses, according to Acts 1 8 and Matthew 28 19 28. Yet certain men are set aside or called for the ministry. The world views preachers as anything but beautiful. Certainly, definitely not their feet. They're viewed as, say amen if you've heard this, egotistical. Y'all won't hurt my feelings. You've heard it. Don't nobody said it about me. Egotistical. Maniacal. That means, look at the front end of that word, maniacs. Conniving. Yep, come on. Y'all heard people have preacher for Sunday dinner. You know you have. Maybe not a reason. Glory hogs. Look at some of these people on TV. The production is about them, down to their wardrobe and the lights shining behind them and how they present themselves. It's entertainment. It's not soul winning. Okay? Okay? Money grabbing, grubbing. Televangelists. But the gospel or the glad tidings is what makes the feet of them who preach them beautiful. Once again, it is not the person. That's how you decipher it. Or tell between. It is the, the message. Amen? Here it is in a nutshell. And I, I wrote this down as a note for myself. The beautiful message goes into ugly places and rescues ugly people. And gives them a beautiful testimony. Y'all should have said amen a little bit louder. That was you. The beautiful message, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, goes into ugly places. Anybody found themselves or were in an ugly place yes. in your life? Yes. Ugly place on a bar stool? Yes. Ugly place wherever you found yourself? And that, that beautiful message found your, your ugliness in sin in that ugly place, but it gave you through the power of, 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 the, of the Lord a beautiful testimony now. I once was lost. Now I'm found. Once was blind. Now I see. Glad tidings. Amen. So Paul then writes, he says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. That's key. For Isaiah or Esaias saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? And, and what Paul is pointing, what he's digging at here is this. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, the norm has always been rejection. It is in man to reject the authority of God. If you don't believe it, look at Adam. God told him. God told him. God gave him one rule. Adam, with nudging from the enemy, rejected. So if you remember a couple years ago, I said, if you look at the progression of sin, it starts with unbelief. Starts with unbelief. And what is unbelief? That simply is you saying in your actions or whatever, I don't believe what God's word says. Now, believe it or not, Christians, you can do that. You can be saved and on your way to heaven and still not believe what God's word says concerning this or concerning that. To the point that maybe you sin or you, you say, well, I know this is, but I don't, yeah. We can do that because it's a battle in our what? Flesh. Amen? So if you're obeying God's word today, catch this, notice this. You are in the minority. Everybody is not obeying God's word. If they did, there would be no need for the 11 o'clock news. Amen? The faithful will always be in few until we get to heaven. That, that word there, if you look at it, that word obey means to literally be the one that answers the door when you hear the knock. 
<laughs> wow. You ever heard somebody knock you didn't get up? Don't answer the question. Let me ask you a little bit better. The preacher ever come to your house and knock and <laughs> you didn't get up? Or, or time out. Let, let me y'all 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 ain't gonna y'all don't like me tonight. That's all right. You ever see the call come up? You didn't answer it. That's a that's a bill collector. <laughs> I'm answering. Come on, y'all. That word obey means when you hear it, you respond to it. It may be uncomfortable. You you may not like it. You may not like what's at the door. You may not like the truth that shows up, but you respond to it. You you listen to it. You obey it. I thought about this for just a moment. You know, you're younger, you, 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 you got up, your mama called me, says it's time to get up for school. You know, you had a choice. One of them didn't, didn't end well, but you had a choice. You respond to their voice and get up and start doing, or you keep laying there. Then the next thing you heard, didn't you hear what I said? Get up, it's time to go to school. That's the way God's word is. Every Sunday when the man of God stands there, the teacher who is teaching, even ladies in your ladies class, everybody, when we hear God's word, Bible study, a layman's class, the youth classes, we all, all of us, including myself, have an opportunity to respond to God's word. You either reject it, you believe it, or you don't. Now, you might be thinking right now, well, that means take it into my heart and just like simply believe what it says. Now, there's more to it than that. It means to live it. Oh, there, okay, here we go. There is a difference in you sitting on the pew and say, amen, pastor. And then go and do what you want to do. The word, the, 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 the message today is about backbiting. preacher preaches you say amen that you go to your job and somebody says something to you and in that split moment you have an opportunity I'm talking to somebody to respond to the word <laughs> let no cross words come from your mouth let let words that edify, let, let, let out of the heart flows the issues we could keep quoting any number of scriptures Salt answer, turn it the way you're at. In that moment, you have an opportunity. You just said amen. That means you heard what I said. You heard what he said. You heard what was said. And you said, yeah, I agree with it. But then you got to live it. There is more agreement than just wording it and say, yep, it is so. But you got to live that it's so. And that was what she asked about a month ago. Why is it so hard to sometimes live the Christian life because the Christian life is more than you just sitting on a pew saying amen right. opening up a hymnal and reading what the word says at the end of the day we all got to walk out of here and live it and those opportunities in which we live it don't always knock on the door and say tomorrow at 2.30 you're going to have an opportunity to see what the pastor said is right if it's in your life or not I found it be like it just pops up and then I pop up. I, I know I'm saying something because <laughs> y'all are a little bit quiet. It's all right. It says I'm saying ouch too. My feet hurt too. How hurt are the feet of those who hear <laughs> the word of God. So there is an importance. Here it is. Faithful, we would count ourselves as that. The Lord said this to me. It's an importance in understanding the difference between quality and quantity. And God dealt with me with that a while back. That I could not get caught up in quantity, but quality. 
And what is quality? We just spent the last five minutes explaining. It is a group of people that meet together, the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones that are continually called out. How are you called out? You are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. You continually live a life that is obedient to the word of God. You do your best to do that. And as you look at your life, and only you can do that, you can see there's a difference from where you were and where you are now. When the knock used to come, I didn't answer. I'm talking about you. But now when the Lord knocks on the door of my heart, now when his word speaks to me, I go to the door just like a porter, just like a person that would answer the door. I, when he calls me, I answer. Can you say that about yourself tonight? You don't have to answer out loud, but just know that that is where the Lord wants his people. He, he said it best. My sheep hear my voice. They know my voice and they respond to me. Amen. So again, the word obey here means what? The one who on the knock of the door comes to listen for who it is. And the duty of the porter, that's what it means. Hoopa, hoopa K.O. is literally the one that is under the teacher. So they answer the door and they sit at the feet of the teacher. Wow. What powerful thought. What a powerful view. That Lord, every Sunday I come here, it's not Christian who's speaking. It's you who is speaking. And I get to sit at your feet while you declare through him or whoever it may be, a lay speaker, a minister, you get to, to declare through him what I need to know so that I may continually answer the knock. That I might decrease and you may increase in me. Boy, that's, that's brokenness, isn't it? Less of you shows and more of him. You lose your identity for his identity. Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What was the mind? He took on a form of a servant, not a rock star, not a big person that was wanting prestige. He became low so that he could raise us up. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Look at Isaiah 53, 1. It's a powerful verse. Just circle it. We're not going to go to it, but circle it. It's a powerful verse that declares that the Isaiah declared, who has believed our report about this servant? This one who took on the mentality of a servant. He was obedient even to the death of the cross. That is what God wants for each one of us, to be obedient to him. To listen to him. So as he connects us back to where we were in the first 13 verses, he brings it back around and ends and closes it out with simply saying this. The Gentiles accepted the message. The Jews rejected it. And for that reason, God has put them again. What's the word? I'm, what's the term I'm going to say? On the back burner. Amen. The Jews failed to respond. In Isaiah's day, the Jews failed to respond in Jesus's day. The Jews failed to respond in Paul's day. There's a beautiful passage. I think I, I might have jumped over it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead. Go to Luke 13. I think that's where it is. Luke 13 It's beautiful, yet it also is heartbreaking. If you put yourself in Jesus's spot as he says it. The words are in red, and he says in, in verse 34 of chapter 13, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, or you could simply say, O Israel, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto you. How often would I have gathered your children together or gathered thy children together as a hen doth her chicks or her brood under her wings and you would not come. Wow. Jesus, a Jew, says, I have, Israel, everything you need. I'm the promised one. I've come for your deliverance. I've got my arms open wide. Hallelujah. Just come to me. 
and they rejected everything before him, rejected his prophets, sawed some in two, got rid of some, pushed them away, wouldn't listen. Sometimes they would, sometimes they would, but then they'd go back to where they were. And he said, how often would I have just wrapped you in my arms, but you rejected me? That literally the scripture be fulfilled. He came to his own and his own received him not. To the point that they yelled the last words he heard. Hallelujah. Them yell uh, concerning him over and over and over again. Down the street, up the hill, through the courtyards, in, the, in, in and around the temple area was crucify him. But do you understand tonight that in one nation rejecting him, one group of people rejected him, saying crucify him, they literally put him in by what they said, the position that God had already designated for him, that he would be the savior of the world. Because Jesus also said, if I and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me, even those who reject me. They are still my elect. I know who I will save. The message will not fall on deaf ears. Somebody will be saved. There have been so many times I have gone out and thought I, I didn't do a good job and somebody heard the message. God still puts that in my spirit. Somebody heard it. Somebody heard it. I'm working on some heart. I'm working in some life. So again, if you're looking at the text and checking what the text says, the problem, my friends and sisters and brothers, is not with the message or with the messenger. It's with those who receive the message. So can I encourage you tonight as you have uh, evangelized, as you have witnessed to that family member, let me tell you, remind you again, they're not rejecting you. They're not rejecting you. They are rejecting the message of the cross. Somebody in here, you don't have to say it, has been hurt. Because somebody in your family you want to see saved. And they're not saved yet. But God's working. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. But let me be honest tonight. If he's elected them, and we don't know that, that's between him and his father. They will come. When they're called. Some come on their deathbeds. Some come early. Some come through some means of calamity or malady. But if he calls them, they'll come. Anybody a witness to that tonight? Amen. So the problem, the problem is not with the message. So the Gentiles are not a part of God's chosen people, verses 19 through 21. Look at this, actually 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. That's the Gentiles. But to Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. We're going to end up where we started out. You know, if I were to preach this text, I would simply close it out by simply saying this. I'm glad the Lord stretched forth his hands. He reached for the lost, but literally on a Friday, he stretched forth his hands. And in him doing that, he called unto him a disobedient people. The Lord himself, who is omnipotent, y'all believe that? He is omnipresent. Do you all believe that? He is omniscient. He saw disobedient Christian 2,000 years down the line, and yet he still decided to stretch forth his hands. Are you glad about that tonight? Yes. And even though there were moments when I have rejected him, when I have, have gone my own way, 
Even when I wasn't saved, I heard the gospel. I was convicted early on, but I just did not yield. I would not listen. I did not pay attention. But one day, I could not resist the irresistible grace of God. If you're in that boat tonight, you ought to praise the Lord right where you are. And he called you and you came. Now, the message as we close tonight is everybody can't say that. There are some in our families, some on our jobs, some in our neighborhoods that are still lost. And even though they don't look like it, you can't, they don't smell like it, they don't act like it, they don't, certainly don't talk like it. They could be the elect of God. They could be the one that is going to surrender their lives. They could be a, the next member here or, or, or person there or whoever God is calling. We don't know that. That's why we have to be on our post. Amen. Israel, last sentence, was ignorant of the salvation truth contained in her own Old Testament scriptures. Did she not know that every single sacrifice pointed to the Messiah? Why would he announce himself as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world? Israel was ignorant to the gospel that would reach the Gentiles as promised in Scripture. So once again, compare this with what Christ said. She was ignorant to the point that he would have hovered over her and taken her in, but she rejected him. Now, you might say, well, where does that leave her? Where does that leave the nation of Israel? One of these days, they will look upon though the one whom they pierced. They will wail because of him. And that word wail means they will be sorrowful and repent. They will see their rescuer, literally, and they will run to him. <laughs> it's coming. And the beautiful thing is, we'll get to experience and see that. They cried, crucify. But one of these days they're going to cry, sozo, save me. Save us. And it's happening, it is unfolding, even now, in the events that are happening in the world around us. I hope you all know tonight, as we close this out, that that things are rapidly progressing. And not only are they rapidly progressing in terms of eschatology and the end times, but they are rapidly uh, disintegrating as well around us. We need to be at our best. The lesson opened up with we are not wrestling against flesh and, bl and blood. Let's cut out any petty fighting. I don't know if there is any, but petty fighting that might be in our families, in our church family, wherever it is. Let's cut that. That's not important. We're not wrestling against one another. We're wrestling against powers that don't want us to share the glad tidings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the goal. If we can get a church that comes together and just sings all the time, and that's all we do, and we, we entertain, boy, if I tell you what, they sounded good, but no gospel is preached, that is anti-Christ. Amen. Let us be resolved to evangelize the lost world. Questions tonight? to consider and fathom and if there's any sliver of hope is you never know on a deathbed I mean I don't even know who the person you're talking about who it was and all that but upon deathbed they could have called out for Christ to save them you don't know I know you, it, just, it just yeah. hurts me because a lot of times I think about my loved ones that's already gone. sure we all have those I hate the thought yes yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 
we all have those. We all have those, and and um, you know, every time you know, y'all on your phone, you catch all these times these these notices pop up. This famous one has passed. This one has passed away, or you get messages. This one or that one. And my mind often goes, especially if I never had dealings with them, and obviously I wouldn't with any famous folks, but but uh, did they know the Lord? Because it doesn't matter upon death how famous, how much money you had, those who are in Christ go to heaven, those who are outside of Christ go to hell. And a lot of times when I think of myself with that, I have to Yeah, he will wipe away all tears. That's what scripture says. Yeah. You know, one thing I was going to say concerning that, if some of these people who had passed on, especially some of those who, who pointed out that there is no Christ or no belief in the truth of, of God's word, uh, famous people, you if they could come back, and they can, but if they could, they'd be some of the most, the greatest preachers ever. If they would witness. But here's the crazy thing. There would still be some that would not believe. Scripture bears that out. Lazarus came back from the dead. Jesus called him back. And there's folks that saw it. But at the end of that text, it says, and they sought how they might kill Jesus. They rejected the truth. So, yeah. Great question. Anybody else? Um, just like these entertainers. <laughs> yeah. They get a lot of people's attention. Mm -hmm. This guy, The Weeknd. Brother Courtney's telling me about him. Has the word Satan going across the back of his stage, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot of demonic stuff happening, yeah. So, and he stands up there and says he doesn't believe in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Just think of all the people who are there listening. To oh yeah, and following along after him. Well, Sister Michelle, rest rest assured that the fact says here of what God's word said: every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. That includes the singer, the weekend. One of these days, he will confess if he doesn't on this side. Like I told somebody on Twitter a long time ago, and they would fight, start to fight with me about something. I said, you either bow now or bow later. But you're going to bow. And so we, we, we thank God that if you have accepted Christ, you have already bowed and said, he is Lord. He is Savior over my life. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? If not, God bless you. And uh, let's close out with a, a closing prayer this evening. I know we have much to pray for. I had a list of some things that I needed to say, but I left that on my desk at school, so I guess that was the Lord's way of saying you don't need to deal with it. Yeah. But I do have one thing I need to say real fast. I mean, we'll, then we'll pray. Yes, sir, go ahead. If Sister Desi's here, I don't know if she is. She wanted to have a meeting with the women after sure. this. Sure, yes. The missionary yeah. formation, yes, for sure, for sure. Let's go to God in prayer tonight. As you bow your heads, and then don't let me forget to remind you to tell you what I need to tell you. Um, dear God, we thank you this evening. We thank you for this Bible study. We thank you for those who were here um, this evening, and we thank you for, most of all, for you being here. Yes. We appreciate your presence. We appreciate when you come in and, and you speak to our hearts and speak to our minds. We are learning. We are growing. Lord, and we thank you for those who came tonight and thought of not robbery to give up their evening. They could have been at home in their easy chair. They could have been at home doing what they want to do, but they came to sit at your feet. And I pray, I pray, Lord, that as the word said tonight, we will answer the knock. We will be obedient to your word. We thank you for the preaching of the gospel that has changed our lives uh, to this point. We thank you for your word and help us to be obedient to your word and to listen to everything that you are telling us. Now, Lord, I know tonight that there are those here who have many things on their minds, their hearts, things that concern them, concerning their physical beings or family's physical well-being, mental, spiritual, financial, whatever it may be. I'm asking you, Lord, that you will touch situations, that you will heal bodies, that you will continue to work on those that have recently come and those who were addicted to uh, 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 drugs and those who have come with issues and problems. A young lady that came 
on Sunday, Lord. I had her in, in school years ago. We thank you that you led her to this church. And Lord, I pray you work on her heart. Work on her family's hearts as well. Work on her physically as well. In the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. We ask for Seth that was here last week. And he spoke out a lot of different things, Lord. And then he said he accepted you as Savior there in the sanctuary, Lord. I, I know you have not given up on him, Lord. I don't know where he is tonight, God. But you know. So, Lord, help him to remember what he said last week. I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, and I pray that you will continue to work on his heart. Bless our church family, Lord. We may be small in number, God, but help us to be quality Christians. Not to be so much concerned with quantity, but help us to be quality. Those who literally make a concerted effort to, to frequently be at your feet, obeying your word. That is what we choose to do. That's what we want to do. That's what we must do. Bless now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please don't jump up and move just yet.